As the sun sets, the smell and crackle of a campfire fills the air. Someone begins the tale of an escaped, disfigured mental patient with a hook for a hand who has a thirst for blood. This scary campfire story has been told again and again in multiple variations. But if we dig deeper into the legend than simply assuming it's just a fable, will we find any truth behind the legend? When several children begin disappearing from Staten Island, New York, rumors of Cropsey's return haunted the area. Both in 1988 and again in 2004, the same man was convicted in the related children abduction cases. Is this man the real Staten Island maniacal serial killer known as Cropsey? Or is he simply a victim of a biased media wash? In this episode, we'll dive into the legend of Staten Island's Cropsey. Welcome to another episode of the Cabinet of Dr. Mystery. I am your host, Dr. Mystery. I tried to create living zombies. Reports that have been made by credible observers of relatively incredible things. All I gotta do is relax and they'll take me to their death. Last chance to evacuate Earth before it is recycled. This is a wicked, wicked world. We are all evil in some form or another. Before we begin today's episode, I just want to take a second and remind everyone to join our brand new Discord server, The Server of Mystery. There's plenty of channels for every interest. There's movie nights, there's listening parties, plenty of awesome stuff going on. I'll link an invite in the episode description, since it's free right now to join. But if the link is dead, then check out our socials, mainly our Twitter, for an active live link. At some point, the server will be only accessible to exclusive, exclusive Mysterian subscribers. So join while you can, because access is limited. I don't always shout out the beer that I'm drinking or the THC or CBD drink that I'm drinking, but I do if it's really exciting, if I, if I really enjoy the, the beer or the um, THC beverage or I'm smoking something awesome, I'll shout it out. Somebody asked me a couple episodes ago what I was drinking during a certain episode, so maybe I'll have to shout it out more, but no guarantees because who gives a shit, I'm just drinking anyway. Today... I am drinking something that I really enjoy. I got an Alley Cat, Alley Cat Brewing. I got a, a 12 pack, a multi pack. And inside, I have a delightful Main Squeeze Grapefruit Ale and Apricot Apricot Ale. Both really good. Grapefruit one, surprisingly, does not really taste a whole lot like grapefruit. But the Apricot one, surprisingly, tastes like you're eating an apricot. It's, it's great. So if you haven't heard of Alley Cat, you should definitely check them out. Probably not available in the U.S., but if you're in Canada, you should definitely check them out. Before we dive into the legend of Cropsey and the history surrounding the legend of Cropsey, it's important to talk about Staten Island. Now, I've been to New York, but I have not been to Staten Island. That is definitely something that I want to do the next time that I go to New York. I'm going to make it a point to go to Staten Island and to look at some of these places because I am truly fascinated by the legend of Cropsey and the, the deep, dark history behind the legend of Cropsey and the history of Staten Island as a whole. Before we go anywhere else in the, in the podcast, I just want to give a quick shout out to Shonen Flop Podcast. You should definitely check them out. And David, if you're listening to this, I'm coming for you, man. We are going to hang out sometime and you're going to show me the ins and outs of everywhere in New York. So... Staten Island is one of New York City's five boroughs. The island is separated from New Jersey by the tidal straits, the Arthur Kill and the Kill Van Cull, very aptly named. Staten Island is separated from New York by the New York Bay, and it's accessible by the Staten Island Ferry and multiple bridges. Now, Staten Island gets a bit of a bad rap, Right? Historically, the area is known for having one of the city's largest dumps, <laughs> one of the city's largest garbage dumps, and it was rumored to be a dumping ground for bodies of mob hitman killings. Most of the residents will attest that the area has since developed into a thriving community 
and that the landfill has been closed and is now overgrown with vegetation. So, you know, Staten Island, it, it's always, Staten Island is always portrayed as kind of that place that the, you know, the city's government kind of forgot about, right? And it's kind of dubbed the forgotten borough. But in recent years, there's been a lot of development. And it's, and it's a really thriving community from everything that I can, all the research that I've done. There's a lot of push to really develop the community to make it a, a better, safer place. However, at the time that the Cropsey urban legend was at its peak, Staten Island was commonly viewed as a, quote, dumping ground. Cropsey is an urban legend, the boogeyman of Staten Island in New York City. The tale of Cropsey was that of an escaped mental patient, disfigured, with a hook for a hand, or in some versions, wielding a bloody axe. Cropsey was said to hunt down children who were out late after dark, dragging them back to an underground network of tunnels of the now decrepit Seaview Hospital. And we'll circle back and we'll discuss the Seaview Hospital in a minute here. But this folktale is most commonly retold as kind of a scary campfire story, right? A lot of Boy Scouts would sit around the campfire and tell this story of Cropsey with the hooked hand who's going to stab you in the back with the hook and drag you back to his lair or whatever, right? The other times that this tale would be told, or the other theories about why this legend exists, is to warn young children. It's kind of told as a way to warn young children about staying out after dark or going out into the woods late at night. And it's kind of a, you know, parents would use it as a, as a way to get their children to behave, kind of, right? I've even heard of different accounts where older siblings would say to their younger siblings that Cropsey's going to get you if you don't shut the fuck up kind of thing, right? Make your bed or Cropsey's going to come and get you. The 1981 slasher cult classic, The Burning, is loosely based off of the legend of Cropsey. In fact, the killer's name in the movie is George Cropsey. And he starts off as a mild-mannered, you know, everyday kind of guy, and he gets disfigured by, I believe it's by teenagers, and then he starts hunting them down. Now, the most famous Cropsey was Jasper Francis Cropsey. He was born on February 18th, 1823, and he was an American landscape artist of the Hudson River School. Cropsey was born on his father Jacob Rousseau Cropsey's farm in Rossville on Staten Island in New York. Now, you know, no one really knows where the name Cropsey really originated from. In colonial times, that's when we begin to see the surname Cropsey popping up on, you know, in written records. Some theorize that the name Cropsey became synonymous with the killer or the legend of the killer, because the killer was, in fact, related or a descendant of Jasper Cropsey. However, that's, it's not proven. That's just another, you know, rumor or, or theory that I read. There's no actual evidence that there was a Cropsey killer, and there is no actual evidence that, you know, there was a killer named Cropsey who was a descendant of, of uh, Jasper Cropsey. It's just a theory that's been put out there. However, the legend of Cropsey, it's intertwined with the true story of the Seaview Hospital and the Willowbrook Institution. The Seaview Hospital was once the largest tuberculosis sanatorium in the United States. The hospital grounds are located in the neighborhood of Willowbrook on Staten Island. So, to kind of give you an idea of what tuberculosis was like in the year 1900, Around 30,000, 30,000 New Yorkers were afflicted with the illness, and over half of them were poor and from urban areas. Now, we've discussed how the Seaview Hospital has these abandoned tunnels underneath. That is fact. That's not legend. That is true. That's real. You can go there right now. It's actually a historic building. I don't know if it's closed off or anything or boarded up now, but, you know, in recent years, obviously as early as 2009, or excuse me, as late as 2009, people have been able to go into the buildings. 
but you could probably go in there and see these underground tunnels if they're still open and not closed. The buildings on the hospital grounds, they're all connected via a system of tunnels. So these tunnels were, they were underground tunnels running parallel with the above ground tunnels. And these tunnels are where Cropsey was said to take his unfortunate young victims. It's also important to note that this area, the Willow Brook area, was also host to a school for the intellectually disabled. So all these buildings are connected, and one of these buildings that's nearby is the Willowbrook State School. This school was the largest state-run school for the mentally disabled in the United States and quite possibly in the entire world. The school was in operation from 1947 until 1987. It was initially built to house 4,000 students, but by 1965, the school was home to over 6,000 students. In the mid-1960s, Senator Robert F. Kennedy, you know the man, you know him, RFK, what? He toured the facility, and he stated that the patients were, quote, living in filth and dirt. Their clothing was in rags, and they were in rooms less comfortable and cheerful than the cages in which we put animals in a zoo. So I'm going to drop a quick clip of what RFK said. I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded, and I think particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit, and that the children live in filth. Uh, that uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because of lack of attention, lack of, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. There's very little future for the children or for those who are in these institutions. Uh, both need uh, a tremendous overhauling. I'm not saying that those who, who are the attendants there or the ones that run the institution are at fault. I think all of us are at fault. And uh, I think it's just uh, it's long overdue that something be done about it. In the early 70s, after an expose by Geraldo Rivera, the school gained national attention. The program was titled Willowbrook, The Last Disgrace. In addition to the overcrowding of the facility, the television program captured rampant physical and sexual abuse, unsanitary conditions, and extreme neglect. Other extremes included improper use of restraints, seclusion, medication errors, and theft. The expose showed the majority of the children lying naked on the floor, covered in their own filth. Who's in charge here, Jerry? This is Mrs. Nixon. I'm Congressman Biagi. How are you? Why are these, why are these uh, patients unclothed? We don't have enough clothing. We don't have the proper help to keep clothing on them. We have a few nudists that will not keep clothes on. They will pull them off. But most of all, we don't have the help to keep the kids properly dressed. You're talking about more money for the, for the institution. Well, that we could use because then we will have more help. Uh, how, long, how understaffed are you? Very understaffed. There are days we have four or five attendants to take care of 100. Condition in a very beautiful ground, very well-built buildings, uh, where inside we have housed uh, the children of many of our citizens who are subjected to the, what appears to be the worst possible conditions I've ever seen in my life. I've visited penal institutions all over the country. I've visited hospitals all over the country. I've visited the, the worst brigs in the, in, the, uh, in the military. Nothing's like it. I've, I've ne never seen anything like it. One of the on-site doctors who was fired for pressing for more humane treatment of the patients he discusses how there are two to three attendants per 70 plus students. He also mentions how 100% of the Willowbrook population that has been there for longer than six months has contracted hepatitis. Now, the reason that this is, is because the school was home to a hepatitis research program. With this research program, staff would intentionally inject healthy children infecting them with the hepatitis virus. And as you can imagine, when you get infected with hepatitis, whether it's accidentally or intentionally, 
you get really fucking ill. This exclusive coverage of the facilities, as well as public outcry, activism on behalf of staff and parents of institutionalized patients, led to class action lawsuits, bills protecting the rights of the intellectually disabled, and the reform of various mental institutions. The Willowbrook State School was eventually closed in 1987. After the closure of the school, most patients were relocated to other facilities, but many have speculated that most of the patients were simply released, allowing them to wander aimlessly around the nearby grounds and abandoned buildings. So most people say that they just open the gates and let, you know, let the majority of them out. That same year, in 1987, Jennifer Lee Schweiger went missing. Although Jennifer wasn't the first young child with developmental disabilities to be abducted, she was the first case to garner public attention. Some local community members developed an organization known as the Friends of Jennifer, now known as the Friends of Jennifer for Missing Children. This coalition, along with other community members, developed a group to search for Jennifer. After over a month of searching, Jennifer's nude body was found in a shallow grave near a makeshift campsite on the grounds of the abandoned school. This campsite was the site of a man who had been living in these woods for years. This man would later be dubbed the real-life Cropsey. He was later arrested and charged with the kidnapping and the murder of Jennifer Lee Schweiger. This man's name was Andre Rand. Andre Rand was born Frank Rostam Russian in 1944. In the 2009 documentary Cropsey, Andre's sister claims that although their mother had emotional problems, neither her nor her brother were physically or sexually abused as children. When Andre was 14, his father passed away, leaving his mother's mental state in tatters, and she was institutionalized in Pilgrim Psychiatric Center in New York. After serving in the Army, Andre was a janitor and physical therapist at the Willowbrook State School in the mid to late 60s. Many who knew him said he was friendly, articulate, and well-read. However, when we see photographs or hear of police interviews, Rand presents himself as severely mentally challenged, accompanied by excessive drool spewing out of his mouth, covering his clothing. I'll post some of those photographs on the socials because it's important that you see how Andre Rand presents himself. He presents himself as this drooling, psychotic maniac, and everybody else says that he's articulate and well-read, and he has a history of being in the army and having multiple jobs and even owning his own business. So if, you know, like, if, if he's intellectually disabled, all of those things would be very challenging for him, would they not? By the time of Jennifer's disappearance, Andre had a long rap sheet including a 1969 conviction of 16 months for the kidnapping and attempted sexual assault of a nine-year-old. From all of my research on Andre Rand in this case, this instance, what happened was he coaxed a young woman to join him, he abducted her, he drove her to an abandoned lot, he stripped her naked and he stripped himself naked, and before he could engage in any sexual acts with the nine-year-old girl, a police officer in a cruiser drove by and stopped him and arrested him and helped the young woman find her parents and get home. So it was just by chance, just by pure luck, that, you know, Rand was caught. Although there wasn't enough physical evidence to connect Rand with this last case or any of the cases I'm going to talk about in a second here, police suspected him to be in connection with four other disappearances. In 1972, a young girl, Alice Perea, and her brother, were playing in the lobby of an abandoned building. Her brother was distracted, and he left her side momentarily, and when he returned, his sister had vanished. Alice was never seen again. Rand was the primary suspect in the Perea case because of his 1969 conviction of child sexual assault and the fact that he had been working in the area. In 1979, he was accused of raping a young woman and a 15-year-old girl, but neither would press charges. Again, in 1981, 
Rand offered a nine-year-old girl a lollipop in an attempt to get her into his Volkswagen. When she refused, Rand stalked her to her home, rummaging through the home, searching for her while she hid in fear. It's unclear to me why Rand didn't serve any jail time for this, because technically, even if he wouldn't have been stalking, even if he wouldn't have been, you know, charged for attempted kidnapping, he would still could have been charged for burglary or, or home invasion, breaking and entering. So it's unclear to me why this 1981 conviction didn't land him any jail time. Nine years after his first known offense, in 1981, seven-year-old Holly Ann Hughes went to the store with her friend to get a bar of soap. Now, some accounts say Rand admitted to playing hide-and-seek with Holly before her disappearance, and that he is the one who provided her with the money to buy the soap. Regardless, the friend that was with her said Rand pulled up alongside them, pulling Holly into his beat-up green Volkswagen and drove away. In both these cases, he was released due to lack of evidence. In late 1982 or early 1983, Rand returned to prison after he approached a group of 11 young children on a YMCA playground. Driving up to them with a big school bus, he convinced them to get on the bus in exchange for snacks and candy. After driving the kids to a local burger joint, he drove the bus full of kidnapped children to a local airport, eventually determining he wouldn't be able to get all the children onto a plane. He returned them all to the YMCA unharmed. For this he spent approximately 10 months in jail. Just 12 days after Rand's release from prison, 11-year-old Tiahis Jackson disappeared on August 13, 1983. Her mother had sent her to the store to buy some chicken wings two miles north of Willowbrook. In 1984, an intellectually disabled 22-year-old Hank Gaforio was seen for the last time at a diner with Rand. And it's interesting, you can actually see Hank in the background in the crowd in television interviews about the ongoing missing persons cases. So these other people were going missing, and Hank is, he's intellectually disabled, but he's interested, he's excited, he's involved. And he goes to some of these interviews, and in the Cropsey documentary, you can actually see in different interviews about the earlier missing persons cases of these young children going missing, you can see that Hank is standing in the background in the crowds. Now, Rand has also been connected to the disappearance of Ethel Atwell and the rape and murder of Shin Lee, both of whom were former Willowbrook aides. If we recap all of these tragic disappearances, Jennifer's body was the only one that was ever found. When they found Jennifer's body, I'm not going to make any Jennifer's Bodies jokes because, like, it's kind of like Jennifer's Body. You know the movie? You could set this up perfectly for a joke, but I feel like it's not the right place to make any sort of joke about a child that was raped and murdered. Jennifer was buried face down, but when her body was in an autopsy, they found that the blood had pooled at her feet, meaning that she died in the opposite direction. So this suggests that Jennifer's body was reburied, and this new evidence has led investigators to believe that a second suspect may have been involved. Another interesting thing to note is that her body was only found after Andre's arrest. He was in police custody when she was found. So, you know, you could say that he, he could have killed her and then buried her in a different direction. You could say that he could have, I mean, it looks like she was buried, dug up, and flipped over. I don't know. That's, that's kind of the impression that I'm getting. But, you know, did he, did he have an accomplice? Or was her body reburied to frame Rand? The whole, the whole kind of vibe of the, the Cropsey documentary is like, people kind of had, had you know, they, they've had enough of him. He's coming in and there's all these cases of him doing weird things with children, being really creepy, even if he hasn't actually raped or, you know, even if he hasn't been co convicted of any actual sex crimes that he's committed, he's still attempted. You know, there's, there's uh, a couple people that 
a couple young women, young girls that claim that he raped them or attempted to rape them. So like, you know, Rand isn't a good guy. You can't look at him and say he's a good guy, he's innocent. Even if he is innocent in one or two of these cases, he's not innocent altogether, right? He's still a creep. He's still an asshole. So people, you know, the community could have had enough of him and they could have found his body or, or, or excuse me, they could have found Jennifer's body uh, and they could have buried it as a way to frame Rand, right? They could have found her body somewhere else and taken it and buried it at the campsite. That is one theory that I've heard. But Honestly, if that did happen, I couldn't fault the people in that community, right? I mean, fuck him. <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, I'm supposed to not be biased here, but, you know, he, he's a terrible human being. Here is where we get to the interesting theories of this case. In the 2009 Cropsey documentary, some citizens speculate that there's a network of people living under the vast system of tunnels throughout Staten Island. Now, the directors take us through these tunnels, and in these tunnels, we see clothing, furniture, cans of food, dishes, and other items that show people recently living in these tunnels. There were claims about devil worship and Satanism taking place on Staten Island. There were, there were signs of satanic graffiti on the walls in some of these tunnels. And someone had written a letter to Jennifer's mother about a secretive satanic black mass ritual. There are also claims that these children are used in these black mass rituals, which some attribute to these missing children. Now, there's also some nuns who have gone on the record in this documentary to talk about the satanic cult. And they've, there, there have been people who have said, I have witnessed this. I've seen them take the children, molest them, rape them, kill them, and use them in these satanic rituals. So before I go into the, my personal theories about this, and we, before we talk about you know, this next satanic cult here, there are people that will tell you that this did happen, right? Even if it seems far-fetched, you know, the satanic panic of the, the 80s is, is well at work in Staten Island at this point, but you know, there are people that say that they've seen this. So, you take that for what it's worth. With all of these abandoned buildings and the dense wooded forest, you know, a lot of dark things can happen on this island. Or they could happen on, on this island. I don't know what it's like now compared to how it was in the late 80s. But, at least in the late 80s, it was a wooded, dense, forested area. Now, with all this satanic talk, it leads us to this cult. It's called the process. So the process, the Church of the Final Judgment, is an offshoot of the Church of Scientology. In the latest Netflix documentary about the Son of Sam killings, it's theorized that the process spawned another branch of cult-like religions known as the Children. Scientologists Mary Ann McLean and Robert de Grimston started the process under the name Compulsions Analysis. Incorporating Scientology practices, the group's theology developed around four gods, Jesus, Jehovah, Lucifer, and Satan. And as the process grew, so did the many factions that broke off from the church. Author Maury Terry's The Ultimate Evil attributed multiple high-profile killers to the process and its related factions, claiming that these killings were linked to underground satanic cults. In this book, he talks about Charles Manson, he talks about the Zodiac Killer, he talks about Son of Sam, and he talks about how everything is interconnected through the process, through the Church of the Final Judgment, the satanic cult. Now, if we look at the process, we see that David Berkowitz, the son of Sam Killer, did follow the process. And we also see that he was in a cell with Andre Rand for a certain period of time. Now, I'm not really sure if this was before all the abductions or after the abductions, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, I would lean towards that he was in, in a, a cell with David Berkowitz before the abductions, and I, I think that's why Maury Terry would be theorizing that 
David would have influenced Andre Rand at some point. Or he would have led him to this satanic cult, or they would have, you know, together they would have established the grounds underneath in the, in the underground tunnels of the satanic cult, and, and that the two of them were communicating, and it was Andre Rand putting the satanic cult's plan in motion. So that's one theory. So I got to be honest here. The process sounds cool. It sounds, it sounds mysterious and dark and ominous mm, until you dig a little deeper. Like, it sounds like a really interesting cult to do an episode on and to dig into the history of until you dig into the history of it. And, you know, through my research, I've found that the cult is less of a satanic ritual cult, right? It, it, it's more of a of Marianne's vessel for monetary gain and financial success and security. And the reason I say that is because after excommunicating Robert, Marianne turned the cult into an animal sanctuary. So somewhere along the lines, Marianne kind of started slowly changing the cult from a satanic ritualistic cult into an animal sanctuary. You know, it doesn't... Maybe I'll do an episode on it, but it'll just be an episode where I make fun of them the whole time. Because it doesn't really sound, you know, I don't know, I don't know how you would, how would you gradually go, you'd have to gradually go from being a satanic cult to being an animal sanctuary. So, you know, when the Son of Sam documentary came out on Netflix, everyone was all hyped about it, but you know, I really don't think that it has any connect, like, I don't think that the process is a satanic cult. I think it's just a bunch of dumbasses who wanted to make some money off of a bunch of other dumbasses. <laughs> it's just like Scientology. A bunch of dumbasses trying to make some fucking money off of rich dumbasses. Sorry, John. You know, I, you don't mean any offense to John Travolta. I love you. I respect you. You're wonderful. But, you know, and, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry to hear about your wife. Your wife was wonderful as well. But, you know, bro, why are you... Why do you give so much money to Scientology? Give me some money, man. Give me, give me like half. Give me like a third. Give me like, a, a, like 10% of what you give Scientology and I can change my whole life. You know? If you're going to throw your money away, throw it at me, bro. John, John Travolta, I am asking you, stop giving your money to Scientology. I swear, bro. I will do right by you, my guy. Johnny, I am here. Let's get back on track here. In the Cropsy documentary, we hear from a Reverend Musket. That sounds cool. Reverend Musket. I mean, I feel like this guy's just going to come out guns blazing. Believe in God or I'll shoot your dick off. <laughs> so, fucking Reverend Musket. He was a minister who ran the Church of God within. Sounds very sexual. If you want to learn more about the Children of God and their Church of God within, <laughs> go back in our archives. The reverend, at the behest of police, took Rand into his family home, where police bugged the home. Now, Musket claims, I have yet to find any audio footage, I have yet to find any actual evidence of this. For someone whose home was bugged, I have yet to find this actual evidence. But Musket claims that Rand confessed to him that he killed Jennifer because of her mental disability and that her family didn't want her because of that. Police detectives have confirmed that witnesses have said that Rand often spoke about how he didn't think kids with mental disabilities deserved to live. Rand has spoken to inmates in prison, and he had said that he was comparable to Ted Bundy because they both liked the Volkswagen. They both had a thing for the Volkswagens. And he said that Ted Bundy's thing, this is one of the quotes that I read, Ted Bundy's thing was women. Mine is little kids. So, you know, if you look at Rand's history, you look at eyewitness testimony from people in, in prison with him and from people nearby him, people that worked with him, they say that, first of all, he's a piece of shit human being. Second of all, they say that, you know, he, he thought that people with disabilities were lesser than. That is one theory why he would attack children with intellectual disabilities or young people. Because Hank was, Hank was around 21 or 22 at the time that he was 
he disappeared. So, you know, it's that's one of the, the theories is that he goes after people with intellectual disabilities because he thinks that they're lesser. Another is that he just doesn't care. He, he lives this kind of hermit lifestyle where he, you know, he would live in the tunnel system underground. He would have a makeshift, makeshift campground and he would just live in the woods, live in, in the underground tunnel system of the hospital. So, you know, all around, Rand will tell you, like, if you look at the Cropsey documentary, you can see that Rand is trying to get the filmmakers to see things from his point of view. And his point of view is that he's innocent, and this is a media, media bi- a biased media wash, that the, that the media has portrayed him as Cropsey, that the media has portrayed him as a killer and, and a kidnapper because of his past. And regardless of who he is now or how he's changed, he's always going to be looked at as a pedophile, as a, as a creep, as an attacker, right? So, you know, also, like, fuck you. You did it once, bro. You did it once. That's enough for me. Although the jury found there wasn't enough evidence to convict Rand of Jennifer's murder, they found him guilty of first-degree kidnapping, and he was sentenced to 25 years to life. So Rand was convicted in 1988. So this would have made him eligible for parole in the year 2008. Now in 2004, over 20 years after Holly Ann Hughes' disappearance, Rand was charged and convicted of first-degree kidnapping. He was sentenced to a consecutive sentence of an additional 25 years to life, making him eligible for parole in 2037. Andre Rand will be eligible for parole at the age of 93. When you look at this, my personal thought is, first of all, it's unfortunate that there are several young children and young people who their bodies will never be recovered unless Andre confesses, unless he makes some sort of plea deal, unless he, you know, has a change of heart and he he tells them where the bodies are. You know, and again, I'm supposed to be biased and I'm supposed to tell you that, you know, uh, he could be innocent or whatever. He could be. He very well could be. He he very well could have only been implicated or involved or, or you know, he could have only done a certain amount of these things. But it's difficult for someone to look past your past of pedophilia and rape and child sexual assault, regardless of whether or not he killed Jennifer regardless of whether or not he murdered or he attacked or he, he caused the disappearance or the death of any of these children or young people, it's, you know, you have to understand that he has been implicated in several of these, several of these, these instances of people going missing, of young children, dis- you know, disappearing or being found dead. So, you know, Regardless of whether or not he's guilty of every single case, he's still guilty enough that he shouldn't be out on the streets. That's my personal opinion. You know, there, there should just be no grounds for this. There should, be no, there should be no redemption from this, really. I understand that sometimes people take a piss on a playground and they get charged with child sexual assault. That isn't fair. I understand. You're an idiot. You're a dumbass. But I understand that that isn't fair. Something that you should look at, if you have a minute, maybe I'll do an episode on it, but I, I'm trying to, you know, we did the, the Children of God series, the six-part series, which was six, five and a half, six hours of pedophilia. So I'm trying not to, I'm trying to get away from the pedophilia because I need a break, for Christ's sakes. But, you know, maybe I'll talk about the Miracle Village in another episode in the future, a hundred years from now. <laughs> But you should definitely check out the Miracle Village because it's really interesting. There's, it, it's basically a, a, a village in the U.S. somewhere. I can't remember exactly where it is. But it's a place where people who have sex offender history can go. And, and like I said, there's some people who are unfortunately pegged as sex offenders when they do something that is not necessarily sexually offensive. Like... For example, that person peeing on the playground. 
right? It's probably not your best bet to take a piss near a playground, but the fact that it's, you know, 2 a.m. and there's no children there, I don't know if you should necessarily be labeled as a sex offender. You have to register as a sex offender, you know? So a lot of people who are wrongly convicted of these things or people who are wrongly labeled or have to enter this, the sex offender registry for whatever reason, they will go to Miracle Village as a way for them to actually survive. Because if you are convicted of a of sexual assault or you're put on the child sexual assault registry, then you can't live within a certain distance away from school grounds and different things like that. So if you're wrongly convicted, it makes you very, it, you know, it makes it very difficult for you to get back on your feet. So Miracle Village is a really interesting thing to look at. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, you can email me, cabinetofmystery at gmail.com. You can also hit me up on the socials, or I'll, I'll drop those in a little bit here at the end of the episode. You can catch up with us, and you can check out the links. You know how to find us. You know, we love you. You love us. Show us some love. We show you love. That's how it goes. But, you know, check us out on Discord as well. As I said at the beginning of the episode, we're on Discord, and we're giving you love on there. You know, I'd like to read a couple reviews, and I'd also like to drop a couple promos from some of my friends. The first review that I'd like to read is from Kaylin Ryder, 14, from the U.S. The title is Deep Dive, 5 Star Rating. I just finished the two-parter about the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez, and was blown away by how well researched this podcast is. The Night Stalker has been covered on numerous podcasts and documentaries lately, but it really stands out here. This podcast covers a lot of backstory and analyzes the why behind the actions and how history impacts future behavior. I will be looking forward to more. Kaylin, I really appreciate it. We all appreciate it. Thank you so much for the review. That Night Stalker series was a buttload of fun. Obviously, it's weird saying that it's fun to research murder and rape, but, you know, it's a lot of fun to look at different documentaries and different podcasts and see things that they're missing that I can add to it. So I, I honestly really appreciate it when, when people notice the amount of research that goes into it, because, uh, you know, it means a lot to me. These five-star reviews, they really do mean a lot. So thank you so much from everybody here at The Cabinet. The next review comes from my favorite, Cat Lord 6 dun, 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 from the U.S. Now, unfortunately, Cat Lord felt that we only deserve four stars, but that's okay. I'll take a four star. Your Children of God slash The Family series is spot on. I really first heard about this cult through a top five unknown video on YouTube, which featured Ricky on number five, and it also featured the serial killing partners Leonard Lake and Charles N.G. on number one. Now that you mention it, Cat Lord, I might have to do that next season. We'll see. If there's enough, if there's enough interest, I'll do an NG episode. Uh, this was back in the summer of 2018, and over time, I've listened to a lot of other podcasts about the cult, such as Last Podcast on the Left, which is one of my personal favorites, Henry, Ben, Marcus, if you're listening or one of your fans sends this to you, I love you guys. Thank you so much. You guys have literally saved my life. I really appreciate last podcast on the left. In addition, he lists Time Suck, Creep It Real, Parcast's Cult Series, Voice of the Victim's two-part episode on Ricky, Oculte Vert Veritas, God, Oculte Veritas. You know, if you have a fucking podcast like this, no one's going to find it. Hey, you check out Occulta Versus. I don't even know how the fuck to say this. He lists a, a couple other podcasts, and he says, I've also watched a couple documentaries on the children of God, like Cult Killer, about Ricky the Love Prophet, and an episode of Cults and Extreme Beliefs on A&E. Okay, so he's... Okay. So I just listed a hundred other places for you to get content on the children of God. But I will say that Cat Lord 6 has put all of these things in here. Last podcast on the left, A&E. And he said that my children of God and the family series was spot on. So Cat Lord 6, what I'm going to take from this is that 
you really appreciated the research and the effort and the energy that I put into those episodes. And you should, in addition to last podcast on the left, you should check out The Cabinet of Dr. Mystery. I think that's the best compliment that I could ever get. So, I think that concludes our episode for today. I just want to say thank you so much to everybody for leaving a review. And thank you so much for sharing us with your family, with your friends, and with other weirdos who appreciate the macabre and and the supernatural that I'm doing research on here. We're going to launch a exclusive Mysterian. We already kind of have an exclusive Mysterian set up here where we upload, uh, you know, bonus episodes and that sort of thing. But I want to try to incorporate it into your favorite apps. So what, we're going to work on something here in the future. We're going we're gonna to offer you like little tidbit side episodes for a small fee so that I can keep the lights on and keep paying for my medication and my weed. Again, we're always going to keep these main shows free for you. They happen every other week and we drop them on Saturdays. So if you're looking for a podcast that's amazing with lots of content and really interesting stories, and a little bit of drinking and hilarious, maybe inappropriate jokes, then tune in to another episode of The Cabinet of Dr. Mystery in another two weeks. Dragon Ball Z, One Piece, Naruto, all things that we love, all manga that were originally published in the legendary magazine Weekly Shonen Jump. But not every series can run for 300 chapters and have a hit anime. This is David. This is Jordan. We're the hosts of Shonen Flop. Each episode, we look at manga that ran and jumped that didn't quite make it. We discuss what it did wrong, what it did right, how the series could have turned itself around, and ultimately, was it a flop or not? Run all your favorite podcast apps, and you can find us at shonenflop.com. Keep on flopping, floppers. Hello, hello, ghouls, ghosts, goblins, and everything in between. Welcome to Across the Veil with host Emma and Zelda. We're two amateur cryptozoologists on a mission to explore the things that lie beyond. Beyond what? I I, I don't know. The the veil? It it just sounds poetic and mysterious. Mm, True. (laughs) Learn about cryptids, folklore, monsters, and things that are just kind of haunted. Anything that seems a little otherworldly and strange. Just like us. (laughs) New episodes out every Thursday on all of your favorite podcast platforms like Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Follow us on Instagram at across.the.veil and Twitter at acrosstheveil1. We hope you join us next time. Across the Veil. This episode is produced by Death Hotel Creative. Hosted by myself, Dr. Mystery. To view more, and to grab your exclusive Cabinet of Mystery merch, visit us at notwhatwesay.com, check out our Instagram handle at Cabinet of Mystery, or our Twitter at Open the Cabinet. Please leave us a review if you enjoyed the show, and let us know what topics you'd like to hear in the future. You can hit us up either on the socials or at cabinetofmystery at gmail.com. If you'd like to leave us a voice message and appear in upcoming episodes, leave us a voicemail at anchor.fm slash cabinetofmystery. Again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you so much for listening to every single episode. Even if you didn't listen to every single episode, thank you so much for listening to this one and getting this far. I truly, truly appreciate every single one of you who listens to this show, and I love you dearly. Please subscribe or follow for more episodes.